Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Before you went to the farm, you were an intern for a while, right? Because there was a formative, I thought that in your book, you mentioned that there was, that this was actually kind of a formative part of your sure. CIA vision. Yeah. Yeah. You've done your homework, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I described that in my, my first book, Fair Play. My training out at the farm wasn't going to start for a couple months after I arrived at the CIA. So I needed an interim assignment and not knowing any better, I took an interim assignment in the counterintelligence staff. And it was really interesting work because my assignment was to update a study that the counterintelligence staff had done on the Rota Capella, which was the, the Russian networks in German-occupied Europe uh, during World War II. And NSA at the time was finally, all those years later, breaking some of the traffic between the center in Moscow and their operatives out in occupied Europe. Uh, they were communicating, of course, via clandestine radios. I found it absolutely amazing to read the first person at CIA headquarters as these transcripts came in from NSA, the drama the tension, the actual patriotism of these Russian spies throughout Europe, putting their lives on the line to communicate intelligence. My job was to incorporate what we were learning about these Russian networks of the Rota Capella into the previous study. And I worked pretty hard on that. And I thought I'd done a pretty good job. And in fact, some of my supervisors did also. So they said, as I was getting ready to leave the counterintelligence staff to start my training down at the farm. Jim, you've done a good job here and we want you to get the appropriate recognition. And so we, we've arranged a meeting, a farewell meeting for you with the man himself. And by the man himself, of course, they met the chief of the counterintelligence staff, the legendary James Jesus Angleton. And on the appointed day I showed up 2C corridor at CIA headquarters. I went into the outer office. You didn't go into the presence without being briefed on how to comport yourself. So all of his lieutenants are telling me how to behave when I got there. I, I'm getting pretty nervous. Yeah. And so finally, they said, okay, go on in. And so they opened the door and I kind of walked in. They had told me that it would be a dark room and in fact, it was. He had big black curtains. He had just one desk lamp and these owlish eyes looking at, at me and a big uh, haze of smoke because he was a chain smoker. And they had told me, stand at attention in front of his desk. He might not speak. So just launch into your brief on your Rota Capella study. I did that. And I'm going, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I was flowing pretty well. I said, uh, this, this is going pretty well. You cannot fail to be impressed by my CI acumen at this very early stage in my career. Not at all. Because at a certain point, he stopped me. He looked me in the eye and he said, Mr. Olson, don't you realize that the Rota Capello was nothing more than a German-controlled deception operation? And that took me back. And I realized then, as arrogant as it might have seemed, that this great mind, this counterintelligence genius, had really lost touch with reality because that made no sense at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had dug deeply into the road of Capella. I knew it wasn't German controlled, but that was his thesis. He saw conspiracies everywhere. He was a double think expert. And so he rudely dismissed me, said that I had wasted his time, I had wasted the, the CI staff's time by coming up with these totally erroneous conclusions. 
I go out to the outer office. Everybody, how did it go? How did it go? And I'm crushed. And as I'm walking down the corridor afterwards, you know, I honestly was saying to myself, you know, Jim, you had such high hopes for this career. And what a shame, because it has ended before it even started. There's no way you're going to survive that kind of a chewing out by the most powerful man in the CIA. So I said to myself, if by some miracle <laughs> this CIA career survives, which I doubt, I don't know what direction it'll take me. But I know one thing, I will never, ever again go anywhere near counterintelligence, <laughs> which is pretty ironic, isn't it? Because I ended up being number seven in the chain of counterintelligence chiefs at the CIA later on in my career. And it's interesting because you probably didn't know it at that time, but later you realize what, how much damage Angleton had actually done, not only to the CIA, but, but to the field of counterintelligence in general, right? Yeah, that's exactly right, Dave. That's uh, the legacy of uh, James Jesus Angleton continued for many, many years after he was finally forced out. He discredited counterintelligence and discipline. He made it useless for the 20 years that he was the chief from 1954 to 1974 because he was chasing phantoms. He did not allow us to run any Russian operations because he was too smart to fall into the KGB's machinations. So we had no volunteers, we had no walk-ins, we had no recruitments, we had no Russian operations during those 20 critical years of the Cold War. Yeah. We lost so much. It was a disaster. And it was only after we finally got rid of him and at the end of uh, 1976 that we were able slowly to try to get back into uh, real counterintelligence operations, running operations against the Russians. Yeah. He had destroyed our Russian operational program for all those years. And, uh, and, and I can never forget that. But even after he left, uh, the reputation of counterintelligence was so tainted. Mm -hmm. It was so out of vogue for anybody to go into counterintelligence that we had trouble attracting good people to go into counterintelligence. And that persisted for many, many years. And, and at the same time, there actually were moles at CIA and other governmental institutions that, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, were, were not being sussed out because of this. That's right. You know, counterintelligence was useless. It was worse than useless because it was preventing us from doing real counterintelligence. Uh, you know, some people said that Angleton could not have harmed us more if he'd been a Russian agent mm -hmm. because he paralyzed us. Mm -hmm. And we were not able to overcome that until much later. I would say that we really were only able to rehabilitate counterintelligence at the CIA in the late uh, 1980s when we finally began to get our act together and good people went into it. So let's, uh, just a